All right. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to Transform Tuesday. And I should have worn a, a rain jacket or a poncho today because we're, <laughs> we're talking about weather here. So let me introduce uh, our guests here today. We can start at the top. Ken, do you want to give an introduction to yourself here? Sure. I'm, I'm Ken Black. I work uh, in the automotive industry. And I guess I've uh, been working with Alteryx and Tableau for, well, Tableau for about 14 years and Alteryx about eight years. And I write a blog called datablends.us where I talk about problem solving techniques using those software packages. Awesome. And I think you're being a little modest with uh, working with uh, Tableau and Alteryx for a while because you've been both a uh, Tableau Zen master and Alteryx ace, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tableau Zen Master one year, only one year. Alteryx Ace uh, seven, maybe eight years. All right. So, yep, it's been quite an adventure. And you have, it, it, there's a little bit of a fanboy approach, I think, from both Trayson and I. Trayson, you want to give your give your introduction here? Yeah, I, hi, I'm Tracy Marks. I've been Alter Ace for, this is six years now. This is our sixth designation. Um, and uh, Ken, Ken is one of those, the few that were around before I was. So that the name is legendary uh, amongst uh, people like myself and Andrew. So we're very excited to have you on today. Thanks. So, and I think when we, we start talking today, right, it's it's weather week here and part of the reasons part of the reason why we had ken coming on the show today is because he's actually been working with weather data for a number of years now um, when you start to learn more about ken he's got uh, a few passions and they run really deep and this is definitely one of those areas if you've ever seen one of ken's presentations related to the weather um, they're really impressive um, and related to clients. So we have him here to, to share some of the things he's been working on here today. So, yeah, Ken, do you, what's, what, what got you interested in kind of working with weather and with climate to start? Sure. Give you a quick uh, rundown. Now, understand I've been doing this independent, what I call it independent research on global warming since 2014, 13 rate timeframe. Uh, it all started in 2012. I was a process improvement consultant and I was with uh, another, this guy is legendary uh, process improvement consultant who trained with Edward Stemming. Um, but this guy says to me out of the blue, we were somewhere in Texas or wherever we were. I don't know, we traveled a lot, but he says uh, global warming is fake. And and because he was my mentor, I I decided to to listen to what he had to say. I said, well, how do you know that? He says, well, I've done the, I've worked with the data. I did the data. And I says, well, can you show me the data? He said, no, I don't have it with me, but believe me, global warming is fake. Well, I'm a geologist. I'm, I've been, I worked 25 years in, um, as an environmental scientist, in, specifically in groundwater and remediation. So when someone says something like that, it kind of catches my attention. And I had been thinking about global warming for decades before that. So I decided at that time in 2012 that I would launch this idea of studying global warming for myself let the basically getting the data and let the data tell me the story of uh what's been happening on earth i didn't know it was going to take me continuing in over eight years now i had no idea i just figured i would jump in there and do a few things well it's basically now with a about every two years i create what i call a phase of work I, i'm in my fourth phase i'm finishing my fourth phase and i don't have a plan for where it goes or how it gets there but um, one thing leads to another is what I would say about it. And so to try to collapse eight years of work down into 30 minutes um, is, is difficult. So what I did was I just put together uh, some slides of sort of highlights that's, that in essence kind of capture what I have found in my research. Now, when I talk about the research, what I'm talking about is I go out to um, the National Climate Center and I grab about 26 gigabytes of data. I pull it down, I run it through Alteryx workflows to do a variety of things. And then I send the data over to Tableau for visualization. So when you when you see what I have here today, there will be a number of different perspectives on the data 
everything from pattern detection to prediction of future temperatures. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately what happened was I made some discoveries that, that I think are important. And um, in the future, the, my material may disappear from my website uh, because of that. And so hmm. it's um, a story that is continuing, but I think um, what I discovered was potentially valuable. And so I'm going to be, I've never done this before, but I'm going to be decommissioning some of my work um, from the website. So uh, that's kind of it. That's kind of the story. And I, it's a, it's a, it's a weird one because I, every few years I pop up and I say, Hey, look what I've learned now. I gave the first presentation at the Alterx conference in 2017. I did again, uh, another one in 2019 and I'll be speaking this year uh, in May 2022, giving the, the latest results. And that'll probably be the last time that I, uh, I talk about this topic publicly. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. Does that answer your question, Andrew? I know that was a long answer, but. <laughs> no, that definitely answers the question, Ken. I think when we talk about um, really kind of getting into climatology, right, and, and studying, I think there's a lot of depth in terms of experience and it's a longitudinal study, right? So I think something that gets me excited, especially being in the data field, is this gives us an opportunity to see what the future of other data types or even sources is going to look like because we literally have 100 years worth of data in some places, right? Now, obviously, 100 years ago, you may not necessarily be able to attest to the accuracy of some of that information that was gathered, but it provides you with those longitudinal studies where you can really see progression, um, you can see uh, depth, and then even from a, a study perspective, did we uh, venture out into data related to like uh, amateur meteorologists, right? So maybe they're collecting more mic uh, pockets of, of weather data. And with I all these IoT sensors, like that becomes another question, right? Are we tracking more of that information? Like something that we experience as human beings is what's the temperature difference between being in the shade versus being out in the sun, right? That feels like temperature. I think yeah. those pieces are important because it outlines things like, hey, if we had more trees available, there'd be more shade that would help offer more protection, et cetera, right? And those are anecdotal. And Ken, are, are you ready to, to share your screen and show us some of the things that are a little more concrete here related to, to yeah. weather? Yeah, sure. The, the perspective that I took from the very beginning was a very near-term perspective. I, I, I basically wanted to answer a question about how have temperatures changed during my lifetime? I was born in the early 60s. So my, my early work started in 1960 and goes forward to now. Um, my more recent work is going from about 1980 to now. So we're looking at four or six decades of data. And this is data from all around the world. Um, so you're talking about thousands of monitoring stations across all the continents. And the uh, it's really millions and millions of data points. So it's, it's a lot of data. You have to be able to handle it. You have to be able to process it quickly and to be able to make predictions with it and things like this. So it's 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 kind of a big data. What? In the garage. I, I'm I'm on a call, babe. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> the gate key. My wife needs the gate key. Um, but anyway, so a lot of data. And what I'm going to show now are some perspectives that I developed by working with this data. And so let me share the screen. Uh, share button let's see share the screen i'm not sure which screen let's see i'm going to try this one and tell me if you could see what's coming up is that sharing yet not yet not yet does it normally put like a red band around it or something yeah it should okay it's not not putting that band. So I'm going to try it one more time. There we go. You okay, can see it. it now. 
Okay, here we go. All right, so put this into slide mode. These are just the basic, these global warming insights that I've, I've come up with. So in the beginning, like by about 2017, after a few years of work, I was beginning to identify what I call these patterns of temperature change. And what I mean by that is global warming isn't necessarily what you think it is. It's spatially and temporally variable around the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so at any, in any, any given month, you can have a different behavior from one month to the next or one day to the next. And I, when I began, I started with the kind of the big picture. I was looking at, uh, here's an example of a dashboard where um, I picked a monitoring station in Russia up here. I'm looking at the monthly temperatures, average temperatures in at that monitoring station. And then I'm plotting the decade average over time. So I could see that the temperatures in the 2010s were higher than they were in the 1960s. So you're talking about mm -hmm. five decades and you could see the change visually. So this was so, so, some of the early work and what I titled it was uncovering surprising global temperature changes. And they were surprising mm -hmm. because I was finding not only temperatures were heating, but I found zones of cooling too, which was um, part of the surprising part of the picture. Later on by last year, I was examining things like how these patterns of temperature change, how they can change by month. So I've taken all the monitoring stations in Germany and I'm plotting uh, temperature change from the 1980s through the 2020s. So I'm doing a temperature differential and I'm computing the p-value of the model that is making these uh, temperature predictions. And so by the time you look at the month of February in, Ger in Germany, 27% of the data in Germany in February is statistically significant at a p-value of 0.05. So when you look at that, all these red dots down here, and there's a lot of them overlapping each other, uh, that's what shows me that in February, Germany is getting hit with pretty significant heating. And I know it's heating because the temperature change is shown in red. And so anywhere from five degrees up to 18 degrees of change is occurring on any given day in the month of February. So each one of these dots is wow. a day within Germany. So that's pretty a pretty compelling story that, hey, Germany's getting hit hard in February. They're getting hit hard in June, getting mm -hmm. hit hard in November. So that's another example of what what I could do with this data. And, and again, this changes over time as I learn more things. But sometimes you get these results which are a little counterintuitive. Um, in Ju it's July 20. So this is a headline from CNN in 2019, July 25th. We see this big jet stream is wrapping down and you get this cool, dry air in, in this part of the country. Yeah. Well, you might think that this is just a one day thing, that this is just July 25th, 2019. And when I say here is the weather data speaking to us, when will we listen? Well, when I plot that particular day of data, July 25th, here, here it is 2017 we can see that it's cool. There's a lot of cool bars over here. Uh, mm -hmm. These are from the states kind of encapsulated within the jet stream here. So this is two years before this was even was um, was taken. So if wow. you if you take a look then um, with the temperature change at all these monitoring stations around the country, what we notice on July 25th is we've got heating out here. We've got sort of cooling over here. And this is work that I did kind of a little bit earlier on, but I wasn't sure of what is what a part of this is noise and what part of this is um, statistically significant. So I have a p-value. So I begin calculating p-values of the models and be able to understand what's statistically significant or not. Is so that something is, with the p-values, is that something that you ended up doing in Altrix? Or I did, did it in Altrix. Okay. Yeah, I did it in Altrix. I extended some work of James Dunkerley to, to do this. Um, yeah. So this is p-value of 0.1, and you can see that there's kind of this pattern of heating and then a pattern of cooling. Well, if we continue with this, um, let's see, where's the next slide? <clears throat> this is sort of um, same thing, same date, and this is a temperature differential from 1980 to 2021. And we've got the heating out west. We've got the cooling over here. This is at a p-value of 0.05. Okay. And shown on the right here are p-values of 0.05, 0.1, and 0.2.
but you basically see the same pattern. You just pick up more monitoring stations, which tell you that there's a statistically significant, th these are definitely uh, significant, but even at a lower value of P or a higher value of P, you still see these stations show up. So these patterns are, cha they change day to day. And when they change, you uh, you don't always know, well, basically I process every day of the year. So it can go from a cooling zone to a heating zone. And this, this repetition or th this kind of change happens um, can be over many days in a row where, for example, a cold blast comes out of the Arctic and comes down into the central part of the U.S., goes all the way down to Texas. And, and so these things are repetitive. They're happening year after year. These patterns have been mm -hmm. established. So here's an example of one. Um, now, this is the state of Arkansas. And so I picked wow. Arkansas for the month of July. And why did I pick July? Because 18% of the data is showing statistical significance. And when we look at it compared to the previous time in Germany, now we see all the dots are over here in the cooling zone. So here's what's what's funny about this is you you might say, well, where do I want to go to avoid global warming? Well, you could move to Arkansas and get a, get a cooler summer. OK, I mean, yeah. and that's completely counterintuitive. You wouldn't think that it's going to cool down in Arkansas in the middle of the summer, but yeah. it does it in July and it does it in August. And so if you lived in Arkansas, you would recognize this over the course of your lifetime. If you live long enough, you would say, oh, the, the summers aren't getting, getting cooler. yeah, it's getting cooler. And how, how much cooler? Five degrees, up to 12, 13 degrees comp over the last 40 years. And that's very noticeable. Yes. Yeah. And that's so, actually interesting because I've lived in uh, Orlando for about, what are we at now? 14 years at this point. Um, and when I look at the time, right, there are definitely months that I see being cooler. And it's interesting because uh, when we discuss that, right, we're only focused on the warming, but it's actually temperature changes in totality, which is what you're, right. what you're even highlighting here. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so today I saw, I uh, woke up and the Guardian had this article here, heat waves <laughs> at both, uh, both of the Earth's poles alarm climate scientists, where the Antarctic is reaching 40 degrees C above normal at this time. Yeah. Okay. In March and 30 degrees above uh normal so th there's the link to the article well in 2017 i had uh, plotted this data which goes from the equator at latitude zero up to the tropic of cancer then the arctic circle and the north pole and when you look at the the temperature changes as you go to the north you can see that for any of these months january february march uh especially it's above the arctic hotter. circle it's getting really hot and yeah. these are over 20 degrees of change at these monitoring stations. And so, you you know, this is something that we've known for a while. But the, again, the data is speaking. You know, when you when you take the time to process the data, you see it. You notice that in the summertime, in June and July, you don't see those big changes. But in the winter, when it's supposed to be really cold, we're getting this excessive heating, <laughs> which is leading to ice melting and Arctic sea ice uh, is going away. And all kinds of things are happening. So yeah. that's another example of it. Uh, sort of the final topic, let's see, do a time check, we're at 319. Sort of the final topic I wanted to cover today was one of the unexpected things that happened here was I started with this pattern detection and <laughs> building these models, and it's literally, I'm building millions of models. Um, but luckily, Altrix is so fast that that can all be done within 20 minutes. It's not it's not it's not like a big computational supercomputing thing. It's very fast. So when I build these models, I thought this year, late last year in July, I said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to I'm going to do an experiment because, OK, it's great to look at these patterns. It's great for me to see year after year. I can kind of predict what what's going to happen on any given day. Uh -huh. I thought now let's do the real thing. Let's actually use these models to make a prediction and in fact not even make a prediction make thousands of predictions predict temperature everywhere all around the world and mm. let's see what happens so i did that in july i had the model i calibrated the models and then i let them rip for six months and i made the predictions that we see on the screen here um the predicted t maxes are in red and yeah. so those were made in july 
And then I had to wait six months for the data to be collected at all these airports. So these are just seven different airports, just sort of randomly selected. Um, okay. Seattle, San Francisco, Colorado Springs. And the reason I just picked airports is just kind of a grouping. I could have picked cities. I could have picked whatever. But I picked these airports and I ran this. And then six months later, I got the data and I plotted this. And I was like, surprised. I was like, whoa, this is actually pretty good. How, yeah. you know, how could it be this good? I, I didn't expect it to be this good. I thought, yeah, maybe in some places it would be good. So I started looking all around the world. I looked in Antarctica. I looked in Australia. I looked everywhere. And I was getting these kinds of these kinds of matches everywhere. So I was like, okay, this is pretty good stuff. Why, you know, how how's that happening? So I started really thinking about my approach. And here's an example of, I, I build these different dashboards to give me insight to, to what's happening. And so I wanted to remove some of the noise. So I did a seven day moving average. And what, what you realize is when you look at it, there are gonna be times when, because I'm using, I'm, my models are built with four decades worth of data. I'm not gonna capture perfectly the day-to-day -day variation that happens in any given year. But the question is, can I capture the essence of what, what's happening in those locations? And mm -hmm. with the seven day moving average, I could see that there are times when we get some anomalous cool data that comes through for a couple of weeks, or we get some big time heating that can happen. But overall, when, when I look at it, the, the trends are pretty good. So then I thought, okay, how good are they? So I uh, actually talked to Alan Jacobson at, at Alteryx and he said, well, why don't you compare it to all the AI ML models that you can find. So he, he said, use this pie carrot package. So I did, I went and got it. And this was the best um, using what's called extreme gradient boosting, a single predictor. This is just using predictions, using only historical data. Um, and then I also did some work with multiple predictors, but that's beyond my time here. Yeah. So this is what XG Boost gave me, and I could see that XG Boost. Uh, I, I did 20 different AML time series predictive methods, and this was the best performer of all of them. And I can look at the average difference between predicted and simulated data. Uh, here, mm. the predicted the predicted is in red, and the actual is in, in gray. Mm -hmm. And then when I compared it to mine, what I call the KCD trender, my mm -hmm. my method outperformed all 20 of the AML methods. Nice. So I thought, okay, I, I'm on to something. And what I'm on to is more work and more thought, <laughs> um, which is kind of the never ending story with this thing, because it's just, as you learn one thing, you get to another, um, another topic. And that's basically what happens is one thing leads to another. And uh, so now the research is getting to the point where I have to sort of shut it down um, in terms of the visibility because of the because of these findings that I'm making, and this is yeah. where where I am now. So that's that's eight years encapsulated down to 30 minutes or less, which is there's a lot of the story that was left unsaid. So I'm okay. going to stop sharing at that point. Yeah. I mean, a round of applause for yeah for even getting through that so quickly. That's that's impressive. I mean, I think one of the big call outs that I have here, right, is what are some pieces of advice that you would give someone who maybe has a project like this and is trying to go more of the predictive route, right? So you literally just outlined a journey in which you did initial transformations, more descriptive analytics, right? And then you built right. up to using, hey, I'm going to try some... Uh, basic maybe machine learning algorithms uh predictive algorithms right and then uh went out and started trying to build your own right is there any advice that you would give someone that's going down that path well um part of what what i'll say about that is if you look at my history i did i spent 25 years building numerical models for environmental remediation so i've, re I've ran literally million millions of models i mean i'm a modeler that's Long before data scientist terminology was around, we were called modelers. That's what we did. 
Um, sure. Certainly not a physical model, but a uh, mathematical modeler, numerical modeler is really what, what I was. So for me, this progression, you described it beautifully, Andrew. The progression was look at the data, start high level, and then begin boring into the details. And as you get into the details, you begin to see things that you couldn't see at the big scale. Uh, so it's sort of like data mining techniques where you start big and you go down to the smaller scale. And like I said, the ability to make these predictions was completely not my goal at all. It was completely, it just happened. And when it happened, I just said, okay, maybe my thought process in this is, has validity. Maybe what I'm seeing is real and maybe, maybe it will change in the future. But the way I can track that is I will now dynamically just periodically, maybe every year get the data recalibrate the models and continue the prediction process to see <clears throat> are things changing? If they are, where are they changing? I can begin to monitor that. Um, but for anybody who's wanting to do this, you have to have patience. You have to basically give yourself a break because I can't do this continually. I do it only when I have time, which yeah. isn't, you know, it's kind of goes in bursts. You, you have to work on it for a while. You need continuity in that. Yes. It's because you need that thought process, that continuity. You have to write a lot of workflows. Um, but eventually you get there. Eventually you, you answer the question, set up a question that you want to answer. Go get that answer. Once you have that answer, is there a next logical question? And I'll give you an example. I'll let Tracen. Tracen, what did this work spawn for you earlier today? Tell me, tell me what you, you thought about yeah, so one of the things that I live in Oklahoma, and even 10 years ago, when I lived here, we got a lot more tornadoes. And now you're starting to see tornadoes more in like the Kentucky, or not Kentucky, I'm sorry, like Arkansas, um, Mississippi, Alabama region where you weren't seeing them before. Uh, so I actually have already downloaded the data and I'm going to play around with it later. But I'm just, I want to see how like the area of, of like tornadic activity has been shifting out of you know, maybe Oklahoma where, you know, we're known for tornadoes and then has that moved? Is that also shifting? That's a question that I would like to answer. And we're actually also seeing, we did see tornadoes in November this year, which is incredibly late. So yeah. um, there's things to be said about that too. So I'm very interested to see what, uh, what I can find. Although I will probably will be tapping on Ken's shoulder when it comes to modeling, cause I'm not quite there yet, but um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting because um, over the last couple of weeks in Orlando, we've had a couple uh, tornado warnings, right? And we work at data meaning, I know we work with uh, cat modelers, right? So catastrophe modelers. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, actuaries as well. And when we kind of look at this, right, from an insurance perspective, trying to understand maybe why insurance premiums are fluctuating um, or even energy, right? When we talk about Texas, hey, are we, um, is the energy company that I'm working with um, who's supplying my needs, right? Are they investing maybe in the right infrastructure or are we going to see more cold fronts which will freeze the windmills, right? So if you looked before at historical data, you might have seen like looking really far back, you might have seen, yeah, that's a good investment. Other than a tornado whipping through here, we shouldn't have any issues. And then now with some of those greater cool offs or uh, off peak cool off periods, right? You might experience something where you wish maybe you bought that uh, Tesla battery pack for your house, right? Or invested in some solar. There's some different ways that this can apply to our personal lives, right? And then also from uh, a work perspective, right? The movement and shifts in those um, are actually critical periods, right? Because even though we may look at uh, when we're doing our analytics, a uh, major meteorological event um, as a, like a black swan, right? Like, oh yeah, there was that that one week where um, I used to work at the theme parks. Yeah, we had a, a hurricane and we never shut down for hurricanes, but we actually shut down for a hurricane and it closed the business for a week, right? Some of those 
components in terms of modeling are extremely valuable because it helps to regulate the business and understand should we be aggressive as aggressive on growth right should we plan for some of these things maybe running a little hotter during uh other periods of the year um so yeah thank you ken for really sparking all of our creativity and imaginations here you're welcome i uh I appreciated Tracen's uh, idea with the tornadoes. Um, I, I do some stuff with hurricanes and cruising in. So I'll leave you guys with a thought. If you're going to go cruising in the Caribbean, what is the worst month to go cruising? I would worst guess September, year. October. Yeah, good guess. It's October. Yeah. You have the, the highest propensity of hurricanes in the Caribbean. That's one, when I teach Tableau, that's one of the data sets I give the students and then and then I ask them, tell me when not to go cruising in the Caribbean. And it's really interesting to watch the way that people try to attack that, that question. But that's the type of question that you might want to ask with weather data. That type of thing yeah. is, if I'm going to travel here, what, what when would it be best? Should you go to Germany in July? Probably not. Exactly. It's be really hot. So anyway, I've got Unless to run, you're... guys. Thank you yeah. so much. Unless you're like oh, me you're and you're uh, in your warm blooded right because i'm down here in orlando that might be the perfect time for me to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank la, la, you last story last story sure. okay <laughs> so i was in italy uh last month we're walking through rome and it was early february first week of february and our tour guide said to me she said i don't understand this weather she said normally this time of the year when I was a kid, this time of the year, bitter cold, we would always be shivering and we'd have all these clothes on. And here we are walking almost in T-shirts. And I said, I can tell you why. She said, why? <laughs> I said, well, you got to read my blog. Um, <laughs> but, but it's the truth. I mean, she noticed in her lifetime how the weather is shifting in February in Italy, in Rome. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking about. Those are the questions that I had in my mind that I wanted to answer and I've answered them. Chicago, December, bitterly cold, used to be, not anymore. Oh man. Yeah. 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 So I got to go. You promise, not to, you promise not to share any of this data with any of the airline industry, right? Because otherwise yeah. you're going to ruin all my potential flight opportunities here to catch some <laughs> good deals. <laughs> all right. I've got to go. So awesome. thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Awesome. So, Tracen, it sounds like you've got some stuff you wanted to share as well in, re in relation to weather. Yeah, it's so not nearly as cool as anything that what he just said, but <laughs> um, we, he and I looked at that earlier, and some of the other stuff that he's got is just, you were talking about Texas, and he has some other stuff about cold fronts in Texas, and it's, it's amazing. He's, uh, that dude is next level. Um, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show a, uh, a little uh, demo that I put together uh, last night. And we're going to talk about uh, just, you know, how to do opportunities, I guess, for uh, interesting uh, analysis in Alteryx uh, using, you know, a variety of tools that come uh, both out of the box and our additional, you know, data package uh, additions. So. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. This is Weather API. Uh, it's a free website. It's super easy to use. You get a million free calls a month. Yeah, this you can take this key, which is mine, and you can all use it as much as you want, and we won't even get close. So I'm going to change this later because I'm not sharing it with you. But um, it's got a super it's a it's a really cool um it's a how, really cool uh website how long did it take you to get set up with this api was it just a few minutes and oh, a few clicks yeah it was like 60 seconds i was in um and and it gets even cooler and i'll and i'm going to show you walk you through this uh you can control like your response fields from within the api so um you aren't necessarily restricted to like building your call to return certain fields uh, everything that you select here will come uh, in your return. So I don't care about, let's say I don't care about moonrise and I don't care about my moon phase and I don't care about my 
uh, that I'm a cancer. I don't care about any of that. So we remove that. We'll leave hours because I'm interested in like wind and time and stuff like that. Uh, we'll leave all this stuff in here and then I'll go ahead and save real quick. Interesting that they even have like UV light. Like this has a lot of information in it. Yeah. And I think uh, that's interesting because depending on what you're doing, right? So um, I actually used to own a landscaping business. So maybe some of that UV rating could be important Yeah. Um, or sun exposure. Um, and then also looking at different factors, right? Uh, we actually did some work with a uh, bakery and some of those factors like humidity actually uh, apply to their business model because that determined how much water and stuff you put in the bread. So that's actually look at that's some interesting. Of, yeah. Look at some of those aspects. If you're looking to play around at weather data, don't just assume that it's going to be exterior weather that matters, right? That, yeah. that does affect even microclimates in terms of inside of the building. And this can help you get some of that information together. That's crazy. Sorry. I'm th now you got me thinking about, Cause like, well, cause I'm also, I, I also, so talking about baking when we, I used to, my sister used to live in Prescott Valley, which is at 5,000 feet. So same as Denver. Right. But like when we would bake, you'd have to bake differently completely because of the elevation. So, um, yes. just great. It's just thinking about little things like that. Um, it's always fun. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh yes. So real quickly, just to also show how this works, there's an API explorer, uh, which gives you your key. Uh, whoops. Sorry. Oh, I have to log, I have to log back in again. It might log me out. Okay, no. So if I copy this and I go to the API Explorer and I put my key in here, oh, goodness. That might copy. Uh, and then you look through here. Um, a lot of this stuff is pretty standard here what uh how if you want to these are the different uh forecasts um or sorry the different apis available so we just use the current one for this example but if i do a show response here it, it gives you the call like i don't even have to build this api url in altrix i can just i'm going to just copy this and i'm going to run right over to altrix which is what i did but it gives you an example of like your response headers in your body so you've got all of this information and it's super cool. Uh, I believe this one is by, oh, um, parameter, sorry. The value, uh, you can also change your parameter. I don't know why this is not, you can change this parameter. This one is currently London, but I did mine by, uh, it says you can do zip code, postcode, name it. So I do, uh, I do a zip code. So like, this is my, this is my zip code. Yeah. So. It <laughs> As we're kind of going through this, right? I think this is actually interesting because it gets on a topic that you and I were discussing before, right? And that's when you're developing relating to APIs, do you typically use like the web form to start or do you do that natively within whatever platform you're working in? It, it depends. There's, there's usually a different, well, if it's available like this, um, I always use whatever the website is because they're, they give you this so you can knock out like Make a bunch easy. of that. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, why would I go into my own platform? Um, yeah. Usually my my pattern is website, Alteryx. If I can't get it working in Alteryx, I go to Postman to figure out what I'm not doing right. And then I take whatever I'm doing in Postman and then go back to Alteryx. And uh, nice. yeah, um, if, if you guys aren't using Postman, that's also a great tool. It really helps... Uh, it's got like a lot of documentation you see actually has like the curl written out and Postman actually looks a lot closer to that than Alteryx does. Or sometimes with Alteryx, you have to like force things into different spaces because you're not sure if it's supposed to be a header or supposed to be part of the body or if there's a if there's actually a tab for putting in your username and password. And so sometimes things work over there. So, so with Alteryx, you have to play around with it a little bit. Um, yeah. But, uh, but once you get in there, uh, this is my, this is a design. I'll talk about this first real quick. Um, a design um, format that I always do. Normally, oh, okay, so this one's, sorry, this one's a little different. This one, what I wanted to do is I wanted to state, uh, when I was able to find this, the current weather in Edmond, I was like, what would be really interesting uh, is if I could be able to track like a route, like if I wanted to drive to Tulsa, what's the weather going to look like along that route? 
Um, wow. And yeah, and, and this goes back to when I was in, I, I this in January, I wanted to, I was driving from Phoenix to Albuquerque and I remember checking what the weather was going to be like across the route. And I was just thinking how dumb it was that I had to like look at certain parts. Two of the different map. spots. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's an eight hour drive. So it's like 500 miles and, yeah. and it's not like I can, so I was like, this would be a super cool um, use case for this. Uh, of course, I didn't build out like an actual route, uh, like a, a poly. I, I did a poly line instead of like doing a polygon that is a series of points along a route, um, which that in a for, like an advanced use case, we could do something like that. But between uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, it's a straight line and it's pretty much follows the highway. So I thought this was a good enough example. So what Thanks. I wanted to do is create a poly line that was that route. And then I wanted to figure out all the zip codes that existed within that polyline and then find the current weather for all of those zip codes in that polyline. And I'll show you how I did that right here. Um, nice. I just used two generic addresses. This is uh, the Oklahoma City Capitol building. And then this is a place called the Gathering Place in Tulsa, which is a really cool, if you're ever in Tulsa, it's a great kids park. It's, it's massive. Uh, let's check it out. The gathering place. Uh, that's my plug. Uh, and then I just did a, a quick split. So I could have, if, if anyone's ever used the uh, the geocoding tool, uh, essentially what it, it does, is it takes a street address um, and then it gives you back a geospatial components of it. So lat long, and then it creates a geospatial object if you so desire. But then it also has a bunch of other stuff here. So you can use it to kind of clean up things about the street, um, all this other stuff that's above me, Tom, Tom information. <laughs> um, this is not available out of the box. As you know, it's part of the, uh, the geospatial data packages. Uh, and what I did was I created two data points here. So let me run it real quick. Oh, sorry, this is taking a second. I also we'll talk about this later. I also had to create it, get the shape files for all the zip codes to do the overlap and that takes forever to run. So. I apologize in this demo. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> what's interesting is we're kind of going through this, right, is um, with the APIs, you kind of learn and get your own rhythm kind of going through this. And mm -hmm. I think each person has kind of their dis decision tree logic in regards to how they approach these. But there's a few key components or design components that kind of bake into this, right? So one of them being um using like a swagger type interface if it has it uh embedded within uh the product that you're trying to use um then maybe using your uh design tool of choice right from a uh, data transformation perspective and then the other layer is more from a coding perspective right maybe you're using visual studio um, or another platform to kind of integrate in that manner indeed yeah. And, I, and I'm not quite to the API point, but I will show this real quick. This is a pretty standard um, design path for Alteryx. It, some basic like a text input with a URL. Notice that I have, I took the, the key, which is the parameter of the zip, and I put in just something that I, I knew I could go in and find. Um, nice. And then, you know, we create a URL and then we pass that URL however many times against the a download tool. Um, but yeah, so I reverse geocoded both of these, or I'm sorry, I geocoded both of these, and we got these spatial objects. And then there's some formatting that you have to do to create a polyline. But when we were done, oh goodness, we were able to get this line that is from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And you can see, uh, well, maybe it's going to be hard to see. Hold on. Um, no, you can actually see it. Yeah. There's this, this is the 44 right here that goes between uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So it does almost exactly follow that line. So it's going to do okay for our example here. Yeah. Um, what I mentioned earlier is I had to get this tiger shape file. Uh, Ken had mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. There is an intense amount of free stuff from the U.S. <laughs> government. I mean, we've paid for it, but you can go get it. There is... Um, like this is a, a shapefile that's every county 
in the country. And it also has just a bunch of information about that, about the counties too. Um, all well, and that's thing. actually what I'm using even for my um, Inspire session is I'll be talking about um, doing 3D modeling. And those are actually the, the types of files that I'm using, those plus some LiDAR data to essentially gather the information together and to be able to put together objects. So when we talk about this, it's not just, hey, what does that terrain look like today? If we were building something or uh, would like to profile something, especially now that people have drones, right? You can really get in there and gather some some cool data. I'm actually curious about that. That brings up a question. So when I was, if you go, if, if everybody goes and does Ken's blog, he, he actually built it originally so you could follow along. Uh, in, in a lot of his analysis he's doing. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of those links are broken because uh, they've moved things around on the NOAA website um, or NAOA, oh, oh. anyway, the, the website. And so, uh, but now to download, you have to download like an NC file, which I think is a, is a shape file that is specifically for like engineering tools. So I don't know, is that, mm. is that what you're using or is that something completely different? No, so I'm actually using <clears throat> some of the older stuff because for Inspire, it's it's specific to Colorado. Um, it's funny that Ken had picked the Colorado Springs airport because that's actually where I used to live, not at the airport, but in Colorado Springs for eight years. So um, it's fun to kind of see some of those pieces tie in. But you have like Garden of the Gods there, which is... Um, a pretty historical site um, when they're, I think it's in the national anthem when they mention the, the purple mountains, right? Yeah. That's actually um, Pikes Peak and that section of the Rocky Mountains that they're talking about. And you can see that from Garden of the Gods. So it's That's quite awesome. the backdrop. Um, but when we look at those aspects, right, in terms of plotting the line, like I'll give you one example of where this would have been huge is uh, my wife and I were driving through going down to New Mexico uh, from Denver and we passed through Colorado Springs. And part of what I wanted her to experience was Garden of the Gods. And when we talk about this, right, we were fortunate in that we had good weather, but there's lots of things that we we look at, especially now that we're working remote, we want that experience while we're traveling. And that experience could come in the form of restaurants, right? Um, or honestly, avoiding like a rainstorm, right? Yeah. Is another good example. So when we're looking at those things, the timing of your trip, uh, Trace, and I'm scared that you're like going to get hired off by Tesla now. They're going to be like, hey, let's do smart routing for your for your trip. <laughs> you can charge at this location. They have the best uh, breakfast. And then you're going to miss <laughs> this rainstorm, right? And then you can sail on through to beautiful weather with the top down, right? And smell that fresh rain. And then you're going to roll up to uh, this historic site, right? And you're going to stay at this beautiful hotel um, that's discounted, right? Because nobody knows that um, in the middle of Arkansas, it's a little cooler, right? So they're yeah, not right looking now. at that as a vacation spot. So you can kind of tie all these things together. That's, uh, man, sorry. No, I'm just, I just keep thinking about Ken's, when you said that, I just keep thinking about all the cool things. One thing I noticed is that like, if you look where, and I'm going to ask Ken about this later, is that if you look where, where it's getting hotter and where it's getting cooler, it seemed like all the places it was getting hotter were in places of high elevation, all the places where it's getting cooler were places of low elevation. So I'm wondering if that has something to do with it as well. Um, yeah, and it could relate yeah. to, I mean, if the atmosphere is thinning in certain spots, right? Areas that are going to be closer to that or under a magnifying glass are going to be higher in elevation. So I think there's a lot of questions that start cropping up, which, I mean, those are macroeconomic consequences that kind of exist. And if you're looking at, like, if you were doing any type of farming, et cetera, right, those factors are going to be huge yeah. in regards to your ability to kind of enjoy things or... I mean, now that you have a freedom as a remote worker, right? Like one of your largest expenses, if you're working from home, may literally be your AC bill. So if you're yeah. concerned about that during the summer, what are some places that you could move to where that's going to be reasonable? 
Arkansas. Arkansas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Florida. I mean, it's actually a little yeah. more even keel throughout the year, uh, believe it or not. But I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where, where were we? Yeah, oh, where were we? Let's yeah, get, spatial let's dive back in here. If you're, if uh, I don't get, it's funny. So I know, I only know how to use these tools because of the advanced certification. Like I never use these tools for work, but like I've had to do the advanced certification three times now. And, and every single time I have to go back through these tools. So I, I, uh, I think that they're amazing uh, and they're what allow us to do neat stuff like this. They all exist here in the spatial uh, palette for those still following along. Uh, this is a spatial uh, map match, which allows us to take two um, two spatial objects. So in this example, polyline and a series of polygons and to match them up and to see where they intersect over each other. Uh, this is really good for things like trade route, trade areas. So like if you have, uh, you know, like let's say you have a bunch of stores in the Orlando area and you uh, have, um, or yeah, have a bunch of stores in the Orlando area and you're like, where, which store do I want to go at? Or, and I don't want to travel more than five miles, right? You build a trade area around your house and then you can say, these are all the stores that fit within it. Or even if uh, reverse, like if you're a store owner and you want to market to people and you have addresses within, you know, a five mile area of your, like you wouldn't want to send out to you know, people with like 20, 30 miles away, you only want to send, you know, mailers out to people locally. And so you can identify all of those uh, addresses with a tool like the geospatial match. Um, but what we did here is we created, uh, we did this. So now I have all these zip codes here that are all part of this route. Now, this doesn't, I mean, the, the data that comes back is is a general, it's probably like a single point in the zip code. So it'll say, it. you know, I might not be getting the same weather up here as is down here, but it's gonna give you a general idea of what things are like across this route. Uh, so what, we've, what we do is we just send, hey, I've got this list of zip codes and I create a series of APIs all of, with our zip codes. And I'm able to download and through our fancy JSON parsing tool and the uh, crosstab tool, I was able to get a list of the current weather and all that. So if we want to look at current precipitation in inches, nothing's raining right now. So that's good news. Um, we've got, again, time. Is it daylight? So this would be even cooler, right? If you're trying to drive across the, uh, let's say, a bigger portion of the like Phoenix to Albuquerque. When, is it going to be daylight when we hit, this, hit a certain place? This is only currently built to times right now, but there is a forecast API that I'm going to play around with later to kind of understand. Now would be cool is to figure out how to add drive time to this using like the Google, probably the Google Maps API kit is probably how we're going to have to solve this if we do want to build like a route and drive time to understand where we are at every point so we could get a, a closer um closer estimation but uh yeah kind of with with uh, the short period of time i had to put this together this is where we got um it's cool man this is the stuff that ken it's i love ken uh every time every time i meet it with him he's always is like altrix is the best tool ever and, and so and he's been saying that for a long time and um just having the conversations and being able to put together something, you know, like this kind of on the fly uh, with Alteryx, like it truly is amazing that I can do geospatial APIs um, and like all my parsing within a single tool and my data, like my data manipulation. Like this is, is I, I'm very interested to see, I'm actually probably, probably going to try to build this out in Trifactor and see what that would look like in a, in a tool like Trifactor as well. Well, and what I appreciate it about this, Tracen, is really when we all see things like what Ken's kind of built over time, right? So he even outlined um, that it's taken him many years to kind of get to this, mm -hmm. right? So it's yeah. not like something that kind of happened overnight. And then seeing how quickly you were able to even just gather these insights, right, and test a hypothesis is huge because it literally shows you <clears throat> over time, what is it that you can continue to build, even as a hobby or as a side project, right? Absolutely. And then what does that end up becoming? And I think the part that's exciting, right, is you're 
you're sharing, hey, within hours, right? Or even even within a couple of days, you can really arrive to the solution that you want um, and then just kind of iterate from there. It's not something like, hey, you're going to have to put in a couple hundred hours before you see any results here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and there's, I think there's the, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, just, there's, there's definitely some experience that's involved with that too. And like, like Ken said, you know, it's taken him eight years to kind of get to where he's at right now. And yeah. if you would asked me five, six years ago to put this together, it probably wouldn't have been, it probably wouldn't have happened in 30 minutes. So um, yeah. there is definitely an experience factor to that, but you're right. I'm actually excited about taking this to the next step. Normally when I build these things out for presentations, they kind of die, but this one is going to be fun to see what else I can do with it. So um, very excited about that. Yeah. And I did drop the uh, spatial match tool link in the chat. So that's obviously hint, hint, if you're working on stuff for the advanced cert, right? That's mm -hmm. going to be our topic for next month for the, uh, Thought Leader Thursdays for Altrix, uh, advancing your, or sorry, acing your advanced certification, uh, blah. And um, as we kind of talk about this, right, um, those pieces are important for you to understand, especially as you're working with different data sets. And like Trace had mentioned, there's tons of uh, information, free data sets around uh, spatial information available out there and that's globally and i think as we kind of look at that right that's something that we all share in common and there's a lot of context that applies there um, if we look as the crow flies distance at stores right if you don't have the data package um, as an example for integration here right or drive time analysis you may assume that well why aren't people coming to my store it's only 10 miles away right well, if you live in New York, everybody's walking, right? So yeah. 10 miles is kind of a long walk. And unless it's along maybe the the uh, transit system, right? You're not yeah. going to have that accessibility. And so when we look at these types of data sources, they're extremely valuable. Um, Snowflake has some for free. You can go to data.gov, mm -hmm. uh, NOAA, uh, which is the yeah. NOAA, right? They have tons of stuff that always comes up that you can scrape. And literally, I think they post it. Um, it's every either every three minutes or every five minutes. So you can either even grab the alerts so you know and you could pluck what county names, what states and stuff are on the list of concern. Um, so you can highlight maybe those specific areas. What would be cool is if we can build something that integrates those alerts and then goes pulls the data as the alerts happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the deal, right? And you could literally see maybe how many false alarms, how quickly did we re react once that alert went out as part of a public broadcast, right? And I think that's kind of what we talk about. If you're sharing this information related to weather data, what are some things that you would change, right? A lot of the weather data that we look at today is primarily historical because that goes back so far, right? Yeah. Um, but weather predictivity is getting better and is even down to smaller granular levels, right? Uh, which is where your uh, use case around how can I go ahead and map out my drive, right? Is brilliant application of that because it really can encourage, hey, if I were only able to drive 20 miles an hour because there's a severe storm coming up, right? And I'm gonna have low visibility. Should I be taking a break now, right? And then I could easily catch up to where I would have been and be rested uh, for the remainder of my drive, especially if you're doing an eight hour, like a cross country drive, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and I mean, background trucking, right? Like, and yeah. how does that affect on time transit? uh how is it your deliveries um yeah. you know we saw we saw the everything get squeezed over this last year right like it, if if things are if things are behind schedule then it, it really affects everything down the road so that's well and i think that's going to be even bigger right when we look at 
the automation that's coming for that industry, right? Yeah. With batteries, when should I be charging? Because as much as I love the idea of hot swapping the batteries under these trucks, right? That's that's not a feasibility right now. So yeah. to start, it's probably going to be there. They're going to be charging. So if that's the case, can we predict when that charge time should be so we could be smarter about that? And obviously, batteries are susceptible to weather. That's going to be even yeah. uh, more concerning or a greater factor that we're going to have to monitor going forward. And that's everything from transit, right, to maybe emergency response vehicles, um, things that are houses that relates to our entire economy. Mm. So, awesome. Yeah. Oh. And just, go ahead, Tracy. Sorry, just on the how easy that data is to get. I'm, I would, I do want to encourage everybody. This took me like five minutes to find, and I downloaded it all on my computer. This is like all storm events for the past 50 years. And it's details, fatalities, locations. This is free. I didn't pay a dime for this. Um, nice. Yeah, that's a, it just blows my mind. Because sometimes it's like, that's the hardest part of getting into a, a new project, right? Or a theory is, where do I find this data? And we're very fortunate to have all this available through NOAA. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. And then thank you all for joining us. So. Um, we're excited that you were all able to join us for another session of Transform Tuesdays here. And as always, uh, we love to have guest speakers like Ken on. And if you're interested in signing up for a speaking opportunity, um, just like he did, right? feel free to um, use the link below for our Sign Up Genius page. And the next one we have is a, maybe a little bit more fun or or funny, right? Is uh, right? Is uh, comedy. So if you've got like a great uh, dad joke um, workflow that you have built out, or uh, a joke setup, right? Or maybe you're parsing some things related to comedy. We would love to see that. So feel free to sign up and become a guest on our show. Thank you, everyone. Happy Tuesday.